Um, does America need to be an empire? We have more troops in more places than any empire in the history of the world. Um, we spend over $600 billion on defense, and that's not including the nukes, taking care of veterans, homeland security. When you add it all up, it's probably over a trillion to keep the monsters away. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we could be just as safe spending half as much. Uh, Eisenhower warned when he was close to the end of his second term, like you are now, about the military-industrial complex, and it seems no president of either party ever makes any progress on that, pushing back on that. Will it ever happen? Did you want to do that? Well, I, look, I, I, I keep in mind, Bill, I've, when I came into office, we had 180,000 troops uh, just in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, now we probably have about 15,000. Uh, so that, that, that's pretty big. Uh, but we still spend a bunch as much. Of folks. We still spend more. Well, you know, actually, you know, our, our spending, I think, has, has been steady. Um, here's, here's what I'd say, um, that um, humility in foreign policy uh, is, is a useful trait, uh, particularly in the Oval Office. Um, I think bad things happen around the world, and our natural instinct is we should do something. There are times where our intervention makes a difference. Uh, but there are a lot of times where uh, the unintended consequences can uh, result in more problems uh, when we intervene. And sorting out where those, uh, you know, where, where those issues play out is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that any president has. Uh, my bias is that if it comes to defending the American people against Al-Qaeda, ISIL, somebody who wants to blow up a train station uh, in Midtown Manhattan, that I'm going to go after them and I make no apologies about it and I, I want a vigorous uh, military in place. Uh, and when it comes to maintaining a basic international order so that a guy like Kim Jong-un in North Korea uh, doesn't suddenly start holding all of Asia hostage because he is building a bunch of nuclear weapons and, and feels free to threaten everybody else. Uh, it's important for us to have alliances in place and to be able to work on the international scene. And us having the most powerful military on Earth helps that happen. It helps check the impulses of some other uh, bad folks. Um, and, and I will tell you, as somebody who has now served as Commander-in-Chief for the last eight years. Not only are the men and women in uniform that I work with extraordinary. Uh, you know, you meet 23-year-olds who are in charge of life and death missions and maintaining billion-dollar pieces of equipment, and they just execute and do it unbelievably well. But what you also discover is my top brass, Joint Chiefs of Staff, they're not the chicken hawks who are going around trying to get mm -hmm. us into every single war. I, you know, the, the, the generals, the colonels, the, the, the commanders uh, that I work with, they know the, the wages of war, and they're actually pretty thoughtful about it. And typically in the Situation Room, they're the, the ones who are like, well, before we go half-cocked on something, let's really think about this, because this is what would be involved, and they have seen what's uh, what's involved, uh, because most of them are people who were fighting in mm -hmm. Iraq and fighting in Afghanistan, and they know how hard these environments are, and, and that no matter how good our intentions, a lot of times it can go uh, uh, haywire. Um, but having said all that, I think we should have restraint. I think we should have humility. Uh, I think we have to, wherever possible, work multilaterally and not just unilaterally, because if we can't organize coalitions to do things, that means that maybe we're, we haven't thought everything through. Having said all that, it turns out that as, as flawed as sometimes our foreign policy can be or whatever blind spots we have, 
we really are the indispensable nation. I mean, if, if, if we, if, if there is a, uh, you know, typhoon that wipes out someplace in, in Southeast Asia, our military is the only organization that has the infrastructure to help those folks quickly. When Ebola came out, we actually had to build the platform whereby everybody else could even think about bringing their doctors and nurses in. Um, if you have a rogue nation that decided it was going to uh, you know, t take action that, that significantly threatened uh, a lot of people, um, I'd want to know that the U.S. military was there and so, and, and, and I can tell you, setting aside our military power, there's not an international meeting I go to in which if we weren't sitting at the table, uh, nothing get done. Uh, because for the most part, other countries don't have either the capacity or the inclination. Uh, and when you've got a bunch of authoritarian governments out there, and a creeping authoritarian impulse around the world. We also are the ones who are pushing back most effectively, uh, imperfectly, but most effectively against locking up journalists and killing human rights activists and making sure that poor people get food and dealing with public health crises. Um, I think if, if, if you see the world from my seat, um, I won't. A sort of, a, a sort of, the, the one thing I think is important for progressives to guard against is uh, a tendency sometimes to not fully appreciate. Um, yeah. That, that America's yeah, the bad guys, uh, right. that, that America's a pretty uh, is not just a great nation in the sense of that it's powerful, but that our values and, I, our, and our ideals actually matter, and we do a lot of good around the world. And there's some things that we do that are either uh, ineffective or imperfect. But there's a lot to be proud of, and there's a lot to build on. You know, now what we got to do is make sure that we get our own house in order so that we can keep yeah. on doing